Okay, here we go. Well, good morning, good day, wherever you are. We just hope you're having a great one. And we also hope you're having a great Thanksgiving. I'm Rick Zanotti, and welcome to eLearn Chat, where talk is knowledge. And today we're going to have a talk on voiceover. So we're going to do a lot of talking on our voices and what we can do with our voices to make them better. But before we start that, here is our co-host in beautiful Wisconsin. Hey, Don, how are you? It is a beautiful day. Hi, everyone. Glad you're here. Glad you're in the chat room and glad you're watching on YouTube. We love that. So, Don, how have you been? I've been wonderful. I've been on vacation this week, getting a lot done. So my house looks like a tornado hit it because, you know, you start a project over here, start a project over there. And then I'm going to leave it today. <laughs> how about you? About the same. <clears throat> about the same. It's been one of those, uh, we only have a three-day week. Hmm, maybe we should take the whole week off, but we didn't. Uh, I think I think most of us are working half day today. So, In my company, we call it part-time off. Part-time off. Yeah, it's kind of nice every so often. Yeah, because I still check email and I have a couple, um, you know, it's internal, but client things I'm trying to put together and uh, I have to buy an airline ticket today, which that ought to be just really fun. Um so I've been peeping at email, but not making phone calls and so forth. It's kind of nice. That sounds good. Well, if you're in the chat room today, ask away any questions you might have regarding voiceover. We originally had a couple people scheduled or hopefully scheduled. One of them was Perry Norton, who is a wonderful voiceover person. If you ever want to um, hire her, I'd, I'd recommend her. Uh, she has a couple websites. I think one of them is Perry, P E R. R Y Norton N O R T O N dot com, and um, she's just very good. She can do all sorts of different voices, from cartoon characters all the way to very professional Discovery Channel type documentaries. She does it all, and she's she's a pleasure to work with. And um, and then I was hoping we could get Jeff Blanchard on board today, but I think he got my message a little too late. And and Perry was was a little sick this morning, so she didn't want to. Uh, well, she was sick last night. She said, "My, I have a voice. I have no voice today. So I guess that's kind of bad when you're doing voiceover. But <laughs> <clears throat> Do as I say, not as I say. Exactly. But anyway, today we're going to talk about voiceover, what it is, why, why it's important, and how it can make your training, your e-learning, whatever you do with your voice, even answering the phone, a little bit better. And people ask all the time. I, I get this question a lot. Where did you get that radio voice? Well, for one, I don't think I have a radio voice, but, and I've actually never done radio, uh, which is sort of funny. A lot of people, I, I've met a lot of people who think I've done radio forever. I haven't. Um, but I have worked on it. I've, I've practiced a lot of, of voiceover work. I have done voiceover for e learning and for some other things. But the thing is, how do you get good at it? There's, there's no secret other than practice. Now, now, Don, you said earlier that you've never done voiceover. I have not done voiceover. So uh, officially, no. Though you do training. I do training. I speak for a living. Yes, I'm here. And when you do training, you're using your voice. Right. So I I do reach back into my singer training. Remember to breathe properly and keep my shoulders down and yeah. try not to stress myself too much so that I lose my voice. Yeah. So all of those things are really important. If you're a trainer and you're in front of people, one of the first things you need to do is learn how to project your voice. And that's coming from your chest and, and thoracic cavity. It's coming from your diaphragm. Um, and that's very important. If you want to get in front of people and you get up and you're trying to talk to 50 people from your throat, and you're going to go, hello, everyone. <clears throat> your voice is going to get high. It's going to get a little constricted. You want to bring the breathing down a little bit, go kind of towards a few. You know, if you put your hand and you probably can't see, but put your hand on your diaphragm and you breathe in. If you're breathing up here, your diaphragm is not working. If you're breathing through your stomach, that's a good thing. Leva is telling us that playing flute helps to remember to breathe from the diaphragm. Oh, yeah, yeah that would... For the clarinet days. <clears throat> that's right, especially with all the air you have to get. 
I think I think Leva mentioned once that it, I think eighty percent of the air is is gone after you blow into the flute, meaning you don't get it into the clarinet. You don't get all of the production from your air, so you've got to really work on your on your lung capacity. But right. lungs are real important, and your diaphragm is very important whenever you do any kind of voice work, because you really want your voice to come out from about here. You know, you want your voice from the from the upper ribs on. Let me let me see if you can see a little bit better. So right about here, maybe second, third ribs, that's where you want your voice to come out of. If I talk up here, my voice is going to get a little bit higher, and it's going to get a little more strained. I feel actually very uncomfortable talking up here. A lot of people, the majority, talk up here, or they talk through their nose, which is something I can do pretty easily. I don't, you know, this is not a small one. But anyway, <laughs> um, you definitely want to keep your voice around here. So it's going to give you a nice resonance. It's a, think, of, think of your chest cavity as just a, a, a good chamber. It's a chamber where your voice is coming out of. So that's a key point. Relax your breathing, bring your breathing down, and make your voice come out from, from this area here. Um, I think we just, for some odd reason, lost our controller. Oh. Not sure why. Yeah, Leva is saying too, funny breathing, she had funny breathing exercises, as did I. Played an instrument and um, was a vocal major in college, music. So I had one um, vocal coach that said, think about uh, using your whole head um, as the place where the sound is supposed to resonate and that it actually comes out the middle of the top of your head so that you remember to expand everything, not right. close it off tight. Right. And the only problem with that is if you hear voices or if you've got an empty head, well, that's going to cause a lot of echoing. So just be careful with that. Yeah, he actually said when you think you can't sing because you have nasal congestion, you're probably still fine because <clears throat> you're, not, you're not focusing then on those areas. You're right. going to put right. your voice where it's supposed to be. Yeah, and it's amazing how many singers can go on. If you ever watch The Voice or any of those shows, they may have colds and they still sing. Right, your speaking and, and, voice is effective, but your singing is usually. But the singing is coming from a different place, and it's pretty amazing. But anyway, get, getting back to voiceover, you do want to work on your chest area, just getting your breathing down to the diaphragm. So I'm going to lean back a little bit. Diaphragm right about here. Bring it up right about there. So when you talk, and again, even if you're mic, you don't want to put your mic right on your mouth. Look what happens. It just distorts. So you want to keep your mic a little lower. Um, and in fact, I have another mic here. Now, this is your typical singing mic. This could be a, this is a, a little Sony dynamic microphone. And you have to get real close on this one because this is a dynamic. It doesn't have any power to other than your voice to make this thing go. Now, this kind of microphone is very good. You can get really loud on this kind of mic and, and sing into it. And it's not going to clip. It's not going to make your, your voice sound distorted. It's actually pretty good. Now, if you're wondering what I'm using here, this is, that is a Rode Broadcaster microphone. This is a mic that's used quite a bit in radio work. Uh, it's also used for voiceover. It is a condenser microphone. It's quite a big, heavy microphone. It does a great job for voice work, and we've been using it on the show probably more often than any other mic. We've got some other mics that are just as good, but this one's just a comfortable mic to work with, and it's it's a very good mic. And you talk to this mic off axis. So if you notice, the mic is not in front of me. This would be right in front of me, and it doesn't work too well. It's very loud. If I bring it this way, off axis, off axis means it's off the axis of my mouth. So it's at an angle, probably about 45 degrees from my mouth, and probably about four to five inches away. So, you know, unfortunately on video cameras, it looks like it's a lot further. This is about yes. four. Yeah, it's about four inches. So it's not very far at all. There's a thing with microphones you have to be aware of, and that's called proximity effect. That's when you do this. And this is a common problem people have. They get really close to the microphone, and then they start going, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickle peppers. Ooh, didn't that sound awful? Because <laughs> you're getting popping, popping, pop, 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 pop. What causes popping? No, it's not your eardrums. No, it's not airplanes, though they do do that. It's your air. When you're breathing too much into a mic, 
Now, if I'm over here, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, there's no popping. I'm controlling my airflow, so it's not Peter Piper picked a peck of... You can just hear that. It just completely jams the mic. It's like a little... And popping, they're also called plosives, explosives. So what it, what it is, it's an explosive blast of air that's coming into your microphone and causing a lot of grief. So you want to be careful with your air, the amount of volume that comes out of your mouth. That takes practice. And <clears throat> I didn't bring one today. It's somewhere in this room. Um, you can get a pop filter. A pop filter is like a nylon mesh that you put in front of your microphone, and that gets rid of heavy breathers, if you will. Um, and there are some that just really have very strong air coming out of them. So it's not for, needed for everyone. It's just you do test and determine that some people need them over others. Yeah, for the most part, in the beginning, almost everybody needs it because we don't know how to control our air. It tends to come out in a really, in a storm kind of manner. You're getting a lot of air coming out of your voice. And they don't know how to do their microphone placement. Most people grab a mic and go like this. Not a good idea. Most, this is only good when you have a dynamic microphone. There are some mics you have to literally kiss. It is on your mouth. It's this far away from your mouth. Okay, that's not a very good mic for doing voiceover work. It's not a very good mic for doing any kind of broadcasting like we're doing now because you're too close. It's not as comfortable um, unless you like kissing your microphone and th there's other therapies for that too. But <clears throat> the whole thing is with this kind of microphone, you want to have it far enough away and, and each mic has what we call a sweet spot. That's the spot where the mic and your voice sound really good. So maybe you get a little bit closer and now it's getting a little bit deeper, but there's also a little bit more air noise. You can hear a little distortion. If I get too far, I'm still getting pretty good volume, but you're noticing probably a little more noise around me. If I go over here, now I'm starting to probably sound, I'm raising my volume a little bit, but if I talk at the same volume, you can probably tell I'm not as loud as I was. Come in right about here, and this mic sounds pretty good. And what was that one again? This is the Rode Broadcaster. Now, this is this is about a four hundred dollar microphone. I think it was five hundred originally, and they lowered it to about three seventy nine, four hundred. So this okay. is a higher end mic. Most people don't need a mic like this. Um, there's a lot of good mics in the one hundred to two hundred range, and and for two hundred dollars, Jeff Blanchard, who's usually either watching the show or he's been on the show before, uh, he got the Rode NT1A. And Rode is R-O-D-E. It's a very good brand out of Australia. Um, they have offices in the U.S. too and probably other countries. They're very good um, microphone brand. And he got the Rode NT1A, which for his voice felt good. Um, I have another one called the Rode NT2A, which is a little deeper, and he wanted a little brighter sound, not, not really deep and bassy. He already has a deep enough voice. <clears throat> so what you, what you do is the mic also enhances the quality of your voice. If you're looking to buy a mic and don't know what to buy, go to something like a guitar center. They have a place where you can actually test out almost all the mics out there and yep. see how your voice sounds on it. Music and um, <clears throat> a voiceover, same equipment? Uh, many times, yes. Okay. But not all mics are built for vocals. So you, you have to tell them right away, this is a voice. Okay. Because if you're a singer, you're probably not going to want a, a condenser unless you're a really good singer because you're probably going to blow it out. It's going to be too much power into that microphone. So you have to be careful with the kind of mic you get. But again, you could get something like a Zoom H2N. A Zoom is a small handheld portable recorder. It's about a $200 microphone, but it's a whole recording studio in a mic because it has a compressor, a limiter, a gate. So what is a compressor? You're going to hear this a lot when you do your voiceover production. A compressor is something that squeezes the wave and makes it fuller. It makes the wave fuller and gets rid of some of the, the noise around you. It really cleans up the sound of your voice. It gives you a, just a nice sound. A limiter is something that stops your voice from peaking so you don't get clipping or digital distortion. So a limiter stops it from going too, too high. Usually when people sing, they've got a limiter on the microphones because some singers can really belt out a tune. So you want to make sure that you're not belting that tune out. And then a gate, you'll hear this a lot too. A gate is something that goes on, off, on, off, on, off. 
it's constantly checking. And these are ratios that you have. You don't have to worry about the math, but there's ratios that say, okay, how much time am I open? How much time am I closed? And what that does is as you're talking, if I've got maybe background noise like this, there's a good chance it may not come on with a good gate because it's going to filter it. It's only going to really listen for your voice and what's close to the microphone, what's in this area. You know, microphones can hear a lot of different things, but they're really focused on what's within about a foot of them. So <clears> that <throat> kind of goes to Leva had typed a question in um, saying the sweet, the sweet spot equals distance plus access, question mark? Uh, by access, uh, <clears throat> distance, access. Okay. I'm not sure which, what you mean by access. A-X-I-S. Oh, access. I'm sorry. Access. Yes. Um, yeah, it does. The sweet spot, every mic is going to be different. Some are going to be maybe like this. Some are going to be like that. Some are going to be over you. Some may be a little bit under. So it just depends on, on your particular mic. This mic is an off-axis mic where it's just a little bit of an angle up. I can keep it almost parallel, too, but a little bit of an angle up and about 45 degrees from from my face. Um and again, sweet spot is where, where, um, where you're the most comfortable and where the mic sounds the best. Uh, so that's what you're looking for in any kind of microphone. Now, for voiceover technique, now here's something that, that, that's important. We, we talked about plosives or P-pops, as they're called. And that's getting air into the microphone. You hear the popping? Yes. All I'm doing is just putting a little bit of air into it. Just now, here you don't hear it. Right. I'm making. You're not hearing it. Just a little bit when you're facing it is is a huge difference. Keep that in so mind. It directs the P sound. Yeah, I mean, if from here, you're not really hearing the popping. Just a little bit. I can go. It becomes a tone instead of yeah. a. <clears throat> yeah, with very little air. I'm barely putting out any air. You're hearing the popping. That's how sensitive mics are. So you have to be careful. There's a lot of people who do e-learning. They get on a mic and they immediately blow it. It just sounds awful. Um, but that's mics. Let's talk about our voices. Here's where things get fun. More often than not, when people get on a microphone for the very first time, you'll hear something like this. Welcome to our class on sexual harassment. Today we're going to talk about sexual harassment and what it can do in your workplace. And and they're they're very inhibited. So it so what you're getting creepy. It, it sounds sort of creepy too, yeah. But you're going to get that kind of inhibited closed sound. There's no projection, there's no intonation, there's no modulation. The voice is flat, it's monotone. And you don't want that. You want to be able to you know, get a little bit of, I keep losing this controller. There we go. You want to get a little bit of, of modulation. So for example, hello and welcome to our class on sexual harassment. Now, you don't want to be too excited about sexual harassment, but, <clears throat> but in essence, you want to have a little bit of modulation. So it's not hello and welcome to our class on sexual harassment. Today we're going to talk about blah, blah, blah. It just sounds flat. By about the first paragraph, you've lost most of your audience, your students. Most people turn off the audio. They do. They do. Because uh, there's a lot of bad audio out there. So what you want to make sure is that you add a little inflection to your voice. So, And that's practice. So you may want to practice something like, hello and welcome. Or, hello and welcome. Hello and welcome. Hello and welcome. Practice reading or saying your scripts in different ways. Get used to the sound of your voice. Most people, when they first hear their voice, hate it. Ah. You know, most of us. And the first time you hear your voice, it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm Donald Duck. Um, <clears throat> when did that happen? Because and in our heads, we sound different than how <clears throat> we do. We do. And then when you put headsets on, you're hearing something even different. You go, I don't like the way I sound. <laughs> That's right. And with time, you get used to your voice. You may even grow to like your voice. And that's okay um, because you should like your voice. It's, it's the only one you have. And there's no operation yet to get rid of your voice that's safe. So you don't probably want to go there. Um, so, but get used to, for example, using inflection. So again, and also practice for your breathing, the P-pops. 
So practice something like Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Now you're not hearing popping. That's a, that's all peace. P p p p p p p p p p p p p. The minute I, I lean into the mic, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. You're gonna get pop 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 pop. Make sure you don't lean into the mic. I'm I'm, I'm gonna reiterate that many times today because that is so crucial, not to get that mic right in front of you or you know depending on the mic you have, but Pay attention to that because that is going to cause ugliness in your sound. Now, you know, Don, when you've listened to e-learning, what's one of the things you notice the most that you don't like? One of the things is people are reading to the, the slides or the screens because there's going to be a next button or a, you know, they're moving on. So it's da 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 Right. <laughs> they drop the voice at the end. And it, it would, I don't know, maybe you can address this, but would it be better to record the entire audio and then splice in as you need to for correction or updates versus reading to the slides? Yes. Actually, when you're doing voiceover recording, especially for e-learning, I really don't advise you use your authoring tool as your recording tool at the same time where you're narrating live. Unless you have a lot of experience narrating live and you're not boring, narrate offline and then import it in and cut it as you need to because that's going to give you a much better sound and you can also catch errors and mistakes that you might make along the way. What what Don was talking about is hello and welcome to this class on sexual harassment and you just kind of fall out. Click. Or, or yeah, click okay. next to continue. Right. And and so you, you you know and I I really don't like when you have to say click next to continue on every single page. Um and yes. I, I hear that a lot. And unfortunately, some customers want it. It's like every page, click next to continue. Click next to continue. And with most voiceover people, you're gonna, they, they, a lot of them have good senses of humor. And they're going to have, they'll start getting a little creative. Click next to continue. Click next to continue. Click next to continue. Click or next the, to uh, continue. And they're going to do it. Keep, or the developer keeps putting in the same chunk right. of audio. Right. And, and that can be okay, too. As long as there's a good click next to continue. Um, That's boring too. <laughs> it's monotonous. Yeah, it does get monotonous. Um, you, know, you might want to do something in your writing, like say something like click, you know, to continue or, or something like that. Or, or click that old next button again to continue. Do something. But, you know, just don't always say click next to continue. Click next to continue. Click next to continue. Because after a while, the, the, if, okay, now mind you, we have had customers who have called and said, I've been sitting on the slide for 90 minutes and nothing happened. <laughs> There's a flashing next button. But there was no prompt on that one specific, specific page to say, click next to continue. Uh, and this has this actually does happen. So you have to sometimes keep in mind the the level of the people you're training to. They may really need that prompt. Those um, people grew up with film <clears throat> strips with records like we did, and there was a tone. And you That's had right. To fix the film strip. Ding, and then you set, you salivate a little bit, and then you switch your screens. It's great. Pavlovian training at its best. <laughs> yeah, Mary Bivett wrote film strips, bings at the same time as yep. I was saying that. So yep. funny. That's one thing I don't like. Um, I will say that generally, my preference is a pleasing woman's voice. Um, as the voiceover versus most male voices, just because they come across harsher, <clears throat> as they've been really trained to do voiceover. So I don't know. Maybe you could address that for it, us. It, it could be that we we have one one guy we use a lot. He is a wonderful voice. I'm not going to give his name out because I don't want to. <laughs> you don't want to. <clears throat> I don't want to actually make people predisposed not to use him. But he's really one of the best VO people we have. But certain women hate his guts. And we're going, okay. And so we've come to the conclusion. He's a good-looking guy. He's they got hate a, him or they hate his voice? They hate something about him. I mean, okay. by the time they're done, they can't stand him. Okay. And it's funny. And we're convinced that he is every woman's ex-boyfriend. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> every woman's ex-boyfriend. He's the guy who has ticked off a woman somewhere down the road. And, and it's hilarious because he really has a very good voice. It's it's kind of a it's a very male voice, and but he's he's good. He's a great reader. He just does a wonderful job on just about everything. But every so often, 
and it's only been women, they'll listen to him and go, I hate him. Well, I, mm. there's statistics out on this that most people, when they're <clears throat> sitting on hold, for instance, would rather hear a woman's voice for whatever reason in the in the the outgoing messaging. Well, there's also a lot of statistics that say if your audience is predominantly male, a woman's voice is a better choice. If your audience is predominantly female, a male voice is usually a better choice. Right. So it just depends on the person, but as a group they tend to like the opposite sex better. Yeah. Um, and in many cases, what we've done, and a lot of people do, is you'll mix maybe one chapter or one lesson will be a male voice, the next one will be a female voice. That's what I prefer, that it's mixed up. <clears throat> and, and that way you have a choice. And if you hate the male voice, you just skip all those lessons and go on to the ones you like. So it just doesn't really matter, I guess. But Move it around. Yeah, but don't do that, because then, the, then you won't pass your, your, uh, your class. So but, we have questions okay. about scripting, and we have questions about uh, recording equipment. So what would you like to address first, sir? Either one, either one. Um, so um, script writing tips and tricks, and um, to expand that, Sheena's asking, um, do you have tips um, or advice for preparing voiceover scripts for external people, meaning they don't have any investment <laughs> in the um, content, I'm going to assume, right. probably don't even know. Okay, well, um, let's, get to, let's get to that one then. Okay. okay. Sheena, one of the things you want to do when you do voiceover script is read your script out loud before you give it to a voiceover person. In many cases, instructional designers never read their stuff out loud, and it reads horribly. Yeah, there's a lot of tongue twisters. There's a lot of things that just don't sound good. Jargon. There's a lot of jargon that may or may not make sense. Read it out loud and see how it flows. You're looking for flow here as much as possible. You know, if you're doing something very technical, it's hard to sometimes get the flow, but, but there's always a way to write it a little bit better. Make sure you read out loud. When you print it or when you send it in a Word doc to the voiceover person, uh, we found that about a 14 point to 16 point type is about best. Don't give them 10 point type. They can't read it. It's hard. It's really hard. Don't prepare it so that's all the way from left to right margins. The eye does not track that well when you're reading across a whole page. Make it half a page. So if you're going to do any, and for yourself too, any kind of voiceover you do, whether it's for you or whether it's for external talent, make sure, give them half a page only. Half a page is going to read much better than a whole page. A narrower column, like newspapers are printed that way So because of how the eye tracks. Yeah, the, the eye tracking really doesn't do that well when you're going all the way from one end to the other and you've got long paragraphs. You will make voiceover people insane when you do that, and most of them will ask for files, and they'll reformat it. Okay. If they're live, and they, they're recording in a studio, and they're reading off a paper, again, be kind to your voiceover talent. Make sure it's half a page, even a little bit less. Make the font big enough. You know, you can even ask sometimes, what, what font would you like to see? 14 point, 16 point? I think most of what we do is about 14, 14 to 16 they won't have a problem reading that. They, they, they should be okay. But if you give them a full page, you're going to cause yourself and your voice talent grief. So that's just one thing to consider. Make your, make your script as conversational as possible. Not always, not always easily done, depending on the subject you're teaching, but personal try to... Pronouns or, I'm sorry? Do you mean personal pronouns using you <clears throat> versus, and we versus... You can, you can. He, she, or... Yeah, you can do that. Um, we tend to like to make it personal, you. So when you're doing your training, you're relating directly to that person. And you're not a cold, distant person reading something that has absolutely no meaning. So you want to make it, you know, put the, put the, think of putting your scripts in context. So in context is also talking to your audience. So when you are creating a script and you're referring to the person as, when, when you learn how to use this software, when you learn how to use this software, not when learning how to use this software, that's impersonal. When you learn how to use this software, ah, even though you is a, <clears throat> excuse me, you is tacit and it's understood, to the person taking the training, it may not be understood. It's just to them, it's just, oh, here's another corporate training thing I have to do. Right, so you think about you're talking to the person in front of you versus it's... Yeah, it's your opportunity as a writer to communi communicate with someone. The key here is communicating. You're trying to teach something, and you're trying to teach it in a way that's somewhat personal and yet makes sense for what you're teaching. Every subject's going to be different. 
but even boring subjects can be taught in a more personal manner. And, and just by engaging the learner and bringing them into the training rather than just talking at them, you're talking with them or to them. I always think of guide on the side when I'm developing mm -hmm. a script because yeah. it's an individualized set of circumstances even though many people are going to participate. But I think I tr try to think of just one learner at a time. Yeah, which is exactly the right way to do it because then you're focused on the person you're trying to teach. You're not teaching a group. You're teaching one person at a time. Right. And you exactly. may have a thousand students taking the course, but each one of them is an individual, and you want that person to learn individually. You want them to feel like, hey, I'm getting something out of this, and I understand why I'm getting something out of it, you know, a lot of times there's nothing worse than when you go, in this lesson, you're going to learn blah, 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 25 objectives. And I've taken those all out. I don't put those in anymore. Yeah, and then people are going, uh, you see the eyes glaze. I think that my personal opinion, learning objectives published need to be for key stakeholders and for buy-in on the overall process and program. I don't think they have any place as the original slide in a presentation or up front in, in, in a voiceover e-learning or even just a visual e-learning component. It's boring. <clears throat> I, I agree. For example, if you're doing <laughs> compliance training, which is the most exciting thing all of us usually do, okay. and, and we've done a ton of compliance training for some very large companies, and, and it's just, oh, it's mind-numbing. And, and you try to get around some of it, and some companies allow a little bit of humor, some don't. And like we did one on one, one sexual harassment course, actually, which was something like, in this course, you're going to learn how to keep your job. <laughs> and, and you know that got people's interest. Immediately they went, huh? What's uh, in it for you? Yeah, what's <laughs> in it for you? We're going to teach you how to keep your job. And, and then from there we went on. So that was the objective, keeping your job. And then <clears throat> we kind of took it from there. But, you know, not always easily done, and not everybody wants humor in a piece. And humor works well in some cases, doesn't work in a lot of cases. And it uh, has to be all humor all the time if you're going to do it. But... I, I just, yeah. it's deadly, and as many people as I read on Twitter and so forth are devoted to good e-learning, there's still a whole lot of bad e-learning and people complaining about bad e-learning, so we can all say we're devoted to this, but, um, but the deadliest thing you can do is put a slide in front of them with a bunch of text-based bullet points right. on what they're going to learn, right. because they don't know if they're going to learn that. Right, right. Usually the title of the course kind of gives it a hint. Right. Um, <laughs> usually, just, yeah. Uh, uh, One thing Leva typed in here, too, is um, that sentences should be shorter, that we don't want yes. long um, right. sentences, that they, they don't know how to figure out how their breath control and so forth is going to be. Right, because, and, and believe me, we've, we've had our share of those where some of the stuff that we're writing or actually reading is, is stuff customers gave us, and it goes on and on. And so you see the voiceover person going, <gasps> and they just go. Um, and, and okay. ideally, you don't want to do that. You want to take enough breath so that you can get through a sentence or part of a paragraph or part of a sentence and then take a smaller breath again to continue uh, till it ends. But, yeah, keep your sentences small. You don't want these huge sentences that nobody can can, can really read in one fell swoop. Uh, and if you take a break in a long sentence or a long section, it can sometimes change the emphasis or the point you're making. And so let's not confuse the person that's got to make the voiceover. Let's make it clear that's where right. the natural breaks are. Now, one thing, and this is really important, instructional designers tend to write so much crap, and I repeat, crap, <laughs> because they like writing. The problem is writing isn't teaching. And there is so much verbiage on a page. Yeah, we, we have an unwritten rule. Actually, it's fairly well written, and it's a couple of slaps on the back of the head, too, every so often. We do the Gibbs slap every so often when things don't, don't work right. NCIS is, is uh, Leroy Gibbs. Anyway, here we slap one of the right Somebody's knocking on my door. Oh, okay. Well, well anyway, one thing you, you want to be careful with is talking too much, writing too much. Be succinct. In fact, that's one thing Twitter is very good at. It forces you to think in 140 characters and no more. So you have to really compress what you're trying to say into something that's understandable. And we're not talking doing you know abbreviations like K for OK and stuff like that. But keep your writing to, to less verbose. Most people don't need to be talked at incessantly. They, they get to the point. Um, 
uh, one of the worst things I see instructional designers do a lot, and it's really sort of a scary thing, is in this lesson, you're going to learn what you can do about this subject. The subject which we're covering in this lesson is about this, and they're repeating the same thing in four different paragraphs. Keep it to one. You don't need to fill space. That's the other thing. You know, people are so used to being in academia or going through school that they're writing huge amounts of data when you don't need it. Right. You don't need to have all that blah, blah to get the point across. You're not writing a book. You're not trying to get 200 pages in a novel so that you can sell and make more money on it. You're trying to teach someone. So as you're trying to teach someone, teach them in a clear, succinct way. So the, the key here is being succinct. From a voiceover point of view, the more succinct you are, the better your message is going to come across. So you want to make sure that your your verbiage is to the point, personal, and not rambling. Rambling is something that happens a lot with with just instructional designers on the whole. There's just a lot of talking. So you know, try to keep it down. Remember, there's somebody who's actually going through this kind of training. You don't want to torture them. And believe me, some of the courses out there, I would say probably 75% of e-learning is probably awful. Um, and it's really, it, it, and it may be more. Um, it actually could be a lot more. And it's a scary little thing, and it's a, it's a shame, but that's mostly because people either write too much, they don't write well, um, or the, the subject just isn't compelling. And then let's, let's add the voiceover to it. And if they're doing their own voiceover, and this is something a lot of us have done, you don't modulate your voice, so it tends to go flat, flat line. The more concentrated text you have, the more your voice will do that automatically. That's right. Um, every writing course I've ever said, you know, they would challenge us to take every third or third and or every fourth word out um, to yep. streamline and skinny down. Um, Mary's question has to do with uh, pacing because she's uh, creating for global audiences. Mm -hmm. Feel like you want to. Down that road a little yeah, bit. we've done a lot of, of global audience creation. And the best thing is think of a newscaster in, a, in any news station. They're not too fast. They're not too slow. Keep it at a good mid-range. You know, so for example, hello and welcome to our training. That's probably okay. Not hello and welcome to our training. That's too fast. Or hello and welcome to our training. That's too slow. Way too slow. I think for every audience. Yeah, for, so you want it somewhere around, hello, and welcome to our training. F you know, kind of in between. If, if you look like you're on speed or you've had three cups of coffee, and that's probably not going to sound too good. Hello, and welcome to our training. <clears throat> and if you start sounding like a hamster because your voice gets really high, that's not good either. So you want to slow it down to the point where you're not too slow, but you're not too fast. Um, a lot of people have the problem, and I've, I've seen some internal voiceover people or, or just – IDs or, or authors who start doing their authoring and it's like, hold on, welcome to our training. Today we're going to learn. Whoa, 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 slow it down. Slow it down. Nobody's understanding you. Well, I think uh, if you <clears throat> have in your mind um, that English second language folks might be listening yeah. or using your e-learning uh, module that they're going to have to do some sort of internal translation. So you want to think about speed and pacing. Um, this is something we don't we we don't take for granted in music. We kind of plan for it, but right. it's easy, especially coming from certain areas of our country where we we t we tend to talk fast. So. Yeah, in some areas. Okay, for example, in the Northeast, in in the U.S., people talk very quickly. Jersey? In the in the, yeah, or New York. Um, <clears throat> in the South, they talk a little bit slower. They drag the words out a little bit more. In the Midwest, again, it could be a combination. Probably a little bit slower. And then on the on the West Coast, it's probably really slow in some cases. So, I mean, these are just generalizations, but they do apply to a certain point. They do. And, and slang, you know, like we, you mentioned a few minutes ago, it's in there too as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and look at, go to any news station anywhere in the U.S. or anywhere in the world, and they have one consistent pace. They're in the middle, um, and they're very clear. So, and they don't have regional accents. So that's another thing. Be careful with regional accents because they may not be understood in other regions. Mm -hmm. So that is something you have to be very careful about. If you have budget for voiceover talent, use it. I, I always recommend you know, don't do your own work unless you have no choice because the voiceover talents are trained to do this, and they usually do a very good job. Um, 
we use a lot of voiceover talent and it just makes our lives that much easier. So and it's a trade secret. Da, 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 da. Um, can you give us a range for pricing so that those of us that aren't doing that currently can begin to put that type of dollar amount in our budget? And it depends. You can get voiceover talent between 75 and about 150 an hour. The good ones are usually about 150 an hour. Some want more. Some can get it. Some don't. Depends on, on who they are, what they are, and what you need. Uh, if you're doing training that, you know, you may want a celebrity voice that you can pay 300, 400, 600, 1,000, 2,000 an hour. Some people don't mind that because that's what they want. They want to brand the training depending on what they're doing. On the average, we're paying about 150 an hour. Okay. And we're very happy with the results we get with that. It's a good mid-range. Uh, it's on the higher side for most e-learning, but it works. And But 75 to 100 is not abnormal. And it all depends on, on the talent, how good they are, what their credentials are. Um, and we tend to go for the, for the fairly professional ones who've been around a long time doing, they, they know what they're doing. And that 150 is well worth it because they make your job easy. Your editing is really easy. A lot of them will edit for you. Um, we, we don't, we, we do our own editing. We just say, give us the raw file, we'll clean it up. Um, but a lot of people don't want that and they'll do it for that rate. So, so in our case, we pay them a little bit more. They're happy, and they don't have to do the editing. There's probably people out on Fiverr.com that'll do their first hour for five dollars, and then they'll have some sort of negotiation. Right, I'm deficit. sure. Now, here's one site. This is uh, Voice123.com. This is a great site if you want to learn about voiceover, if you want to become a voiceover person, or put your portfolio out there. They're one of the better ones. Another one is Voices.com. But this is definitely one of the the better ones out there. So I'd recommend go visit them. And if you want to really get into voiceover more and you want to set up a profile, they're easy to do. It's free. And then uh, they also have a paid service where you can actually become a voiceover person and they'll give you auditions. And you have to audition for it like anything else in this world. Um, live, there are a, a couple um, schools there's that a are lot. teaching yep. uh, broadcast journalism and yep. uh, that sort of work. So yep. I have to believe that they would be um, willing students at a probably reasonable price. Yeah, in fact, any kind of theater arts students, uh, broadcasting students, media, they're, they're usually very, very motivated. So well, I have one other set okay. of questions. And this is going to have, have to be our last one because we're going to have to get going today. That's right. I, look what time it is. Um, Mary wrote quite early in the show, a little bit about um, recording environment um, and how, to, where to record software, environment, so forth. Ah, we can spend a lot of time on that one. Record in a quiet place. Watch out for echoes. You usually have to do a little bit of sound treatment if you do a lot of recording or have a headphone mic that's very close to your mouth. Those will actually get rid of a lot of the noise issues. But if not, you're gonna wind up with a lot of echo in your room. So you have to be careful with the room. Um, if nothing else, putting up curtains on walls or uh, putting up moving carpets, things like that will all help dampen the, the amount of echo, vibration, and bass that you're going to get into a recording. So just try to keep as quiet a room as possible. And, and again, if you're doing recording in a very noisy area, a headset is going to be your best bet. Uh, and as far as other stuff, you know, we can probably do another show on this because people always have an interest on, on what kind of recording equipment and everything else. But for today, let's just say keep your room as quiet as possible. So you're trying to avoid sound bouncing all over the place and giving you too much echo. Like people knocking on the door probably isn't ideal. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, we are, at the end of, uh, we are at the end of our show today. We thank you so much for being there. And, and by the way, if you're in the States or anywhere else, we hope you have a great and happy Thanksgiving. And I know we're very grateful to be here. And um, we hope that you guys have a great Thanksgiving as well. And have a, have a safe uh, four days off. I know in Canada, you guys have had your Thanksgiving last month. Um, we got all the remaining turkeys. And, and so we're doing OK right now. Well, we'll um, I, we want to say thank you for following us. And please continue. Have a great day. Have a great one, everybody. We'll see you next week on Elon Chat. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.